who uh, come and talk this morning, I asked him what I should talk about, and he gave me a little list that sort of started when God made heaven and earth and finished on the landing of Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll attempt to go through it very quickly. Uh, my young days at school, I lived in a place called Bunnythorpe, which for those of you who don't know, is midway between Fielding and Palmerston North. And uh, it was not a bad place for aeroplanes there, because it was Palmerston North Airport, Airport Fielding, and of course Ohakia. And I can recall seeing a lot of activity from Ohakia. I remember when a, a Vulcan came past, we went out of school to look at this Vulcan go past. It actually crashed at not badly at, uh, at Ohakia and got, had to get fixed and went back to London and then crashed alone get, <coughs> arriving in, uh, in London Airport. And the, uh, the crash report said that the cause of that was that they were landing at a civil airport and the civil airports, the civil system, worked on a altimeter setting based on sea level. It was called Q&H. So that the, when you land, the altimeter shows the height of the sea level. The Air Force worked on a, an altimeter setting of zero feet QFE, which is at zero feet at the runway. And the pilot from the on the uh, on the Vulcan, as this thing was coming in, got an altimeter setting, and he set it set it up as QFE, uh, when in fact it was QNH. And he landed in the cabbage patch a couple of miles short of the runway. It must have been in instrument conditions, but. Uh, the thing that surprised everybody was that the pilot and the co-pilot ejected and the two or three other people that were in the aeroplane all died because they didn't have ejector seats. They had to jump out through the bottom, which once you've had a cannon, a cabin pa cabbage patch is, uh, is, is not a heap of, uh, heap of fun. Uh, of course at that stage there was a lot of uh, activity at uh, Ohaki, it was just the end of this uh, uh, Korean War. A lot of American stuff came through. But Globe masters and flying fortresses and things, and probably the most impressive was an air show they had where they had F-86 Thunder jets, and uh, they they weren't very pretty aeroplanes, but what they did was broke the sound barrier the first time over New Zealand, and uh, I, I can recall all the information beforehand said if you live in the vicinity, leave your house windows open, and <laughs> when, you, when you come and park at Ohaki, you leave your car windows down. And, then this, these things are less likely to break it. But I remember the noise of those things was, uh, was, was quite fantastic. Uh, but really my interest in it was because I read Biggles books. I, I, I recall when I first went to secondary school uh, in the third form and the English teacher went around introducing himself and talking to the children. He said to me, what was the last book you read? And I said something like Biggles Sweeps the Desert or something because I had quite a stack of these things. He looked at me like I was a gross imbecile <laughs> and said that he thought Biggles books should be, you should be finished reading Biggles books by the time you're in standard three. And he went on to make me feel bad. He sort of said that his daughter was in standard two and she was reading some classic like Pride and Prejudice. <coughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like this about her at all. <laughs> I actually got into, into flying um, in 1976 when my wife was about nine months pregnant. And we came for a Sunday drive and we'd come out through the town and by chance finished up at Ardmore and over in the far corner there was a coffee shop. Brian had remember that by the Aero Club. And uh, we had a cup of coffee and walked out the door and wandered around the aeroplanes. And over in the middle by the tower there were a number of buildings. One of them was Ardmore Flying School. And uh, the other one was Dennis Thompson's sales place. And, uh, I was just absolutely shocked and amazed. We went there and there's all these aeroplanes out with stickers on them just like a car yard. And uh, I looked all over these carefully and got enthusiastic. And by the time I left, I bought an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I didn't to learn to fly. Of course, I learned to fly at Arnold Flying School and they taught me good things like always land down the centre line. I never land down the centre line now. I've learned <laughs> since then. But uh, that's what, <laughs> that, 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 that was the sort of thing they taught me. The aeroplane I bought was a Grumman Traveller. 4C, quite a nice aeroplane. After a while I upgraded that to a, uh, a Grumman Tiger, which was a 180 horsepower later model, not much nicer aeroplane. I used to do that, fly in business on that a bit. Uh, the, uh, I, I, after a bit I decided going down to Christchurch in the Grumman Tiger was quite a big exercise. So I, I bought a 
part of maybe a P68C Lima Alpha Lima, which is still flying, flies out of fielding in fact now. Uh, that was a nice aeroplane, uh, got an instrument rating. Uh, the problem with uh, that was that instrument ratings are really good, those, those sorts of aeroplanes in the summer. <laughs> but in the winter I found it, you know, you've got, you've got ice and thunderstorms and things that wasn't too good. So I sold that and bought a, uh, an, a better part maybe, a P68C, that uh, had the ice and gear and, uh, and, and a, a weather radar. The weather radar is really good, but the ice and gear is not actually that flash. Might be okay at 16,000 feet, but when you're at 8,000, everything was very mushy anyway, so it, it wasn't that good. Uh, but I still have that aeroplane, and it's for sale if anyone would like to buy it. <laughs> uh, during, I, I, I'm an engineer by training, and uh, so during that sort of period of number of years I've had aeroplanes, I, uh, I started to build an aeroplane, a Steen Skybolt, which is a biplane, an aerobatic biplane. And I, I was never going to get it finished, so I actually paid someone else to finish it for me. And when I got it, it was just a really great aeroplane to learn aerobatics. And it, uh, it just did everything like, a, like the book says you should. It had an inverted system. It did it nice and slowly, and, and it was recoverable from pretty much any position. It, it, it was really great. Uh, the problem I had was that I'd do two rolls, and I'd be start sweating up the back and feeling terrible. And then I was thought I'd come, I'd come back and say, "Why the hell am I doing this?" Uh, and then I gradually increased to three rolls. And then suddenly it all came right. Uh, and I joined the aerobatic club, which was really good because that gave a progression of skills and ability to go through over a number of years. Uh, I upgraded that aeroplane to Pitts, a Pitts S2S, with WIZ, and it was just like the Skybolt, only more power, lighter, more maneuverable. So it was a really good upgrade. Uh, at that stage, the, the world of aerobatic flight was going into monoplanes, so I bought a, a G202. Not NUT, and it's still on the airfield here. And it is an absolutely marvellous aeroplane. Absolutely marvellous aeroplane. Two fingers, you go like that, and the, to take it, the aileron across, and it'll start rolling 500 degrees a second, and just go back <laughs> and it stops. <laughs> the side of the canopy was all uh, sort of scratched. First, it's kind of because as you stop, your head sort of bangs against the side. And, but 500 degrees a second is quite quick. Uh, and that was uh, a great aeroplane. Uh, I upgraded that to an MXS, which is a similar aeroplane uh, with uh, a bit much bigger engine, more power. And I've been flying that for uh, a number of years. Uh, I got that, I was first with that in 2008. And uh, I've just, in the last year, few months, upgraded that to an MXS, which is uh, an upgraded version. It's actually a single seat, so it has a lot less angular momentum. It's called the static moment, it's a lot smaller. So in a, in a bike, in, in a tandem seat, two seat aeroplane, you've got to have a fairly big range that you can put the centre of gravity in, and that makes a big pendulum. Uh, with a single seat, that thing is produced a lot closer. It has a uh, same wing, much bigger rudder, and a, uh, and, and a different set of prop blades, and the prop blades make a big difference too. Uh, the difference in the rudder and the, and the angular momentum is quite marked. In my airshow routine, you may have seen it, I do a, an inverted flat spin. And I do this flat spin and I class it as really good if I could stop it and then just fly away. Uh, and, but when I, I, I put recovery in, it used to take something over a turn, about a turn and a quarter to a turn and a half to stop. And stop and then I would just try to try to get it to fly away. And uh, on this new aeroplane, I come around when I, I apply stop, it stops within about a quarter of a turn. And it doesn't only stop in a quarter of a turn, it stops and bunch straight back over the top. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amazing. Uh, 